Okay, stream is good. Bless you. It's a good way to start it off. All right, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Kartik, I'm one of the co-founders of ETH Global and welcome to uh, HackFS judging. So um, for those of you who don't know, HackFS was a month long hackathon that um, we did in partnership with Protocol Labs as ETH Global. And uh, we're taking this entire week for uh, showcasing the projects that came out of this event. Um, so for as a quick summary for people watching this uh, on, on video, uh, the past four weeks, we've had 470 hackers from different, 50 different countries are working across 19 different time zones. And uh, we had a whole mix of people who were beginners uh, and, and intermediate and advanced in their skill sets on the understanding of the Ethereum and the, the protocol last while and ecosystem. And they spent the last four weeks working on projects that use and show creative uses of both of these technologies. And as of last Thursday, we're super excited to say that we have had 132 projects that came out of this event and uh, we're kicking off a whole week of showcasing these amazing projects. And today is day four of our demos. So I'm gonna quickly walk through the logistics of how this call is going to work uh, for everybody watching this uh, in recording. Uh, there's going to be 13 teams that are, go on, that are going to go on today. Uh, each team will have four minutes for a demo and four minutes for a Q and A. And to minimize any logistical and AD issues, we've asked all the teams to pre-record their demos so we can quickly walk through and, and adjust uh, if, if something is uh, is uh, not working according to expectations. And uh, as a quick overview of how the event itself was structured, uh, each team had a maximum of five members they could work with. A lot of the projects are, are in groups, but we also have a lot of individuals who uh, are going to be demoing. And as a, a general rule, uh, all code that you're gonna see today was written over the course of uh, this event. So everything was done uh, as, uh, as the event itself began. And the only criteria for uh, being eligible to, uh, to demo and, and be part of this event is that they must incorporate the tools and technologies from the protocol labs and the Ethereum ecosystem. So we're seeing a lot of really interesting and creative mashups of what you can do with decentralized storage and smart contracts. And the way we're gonna think about judging these teams today is going to be on these five different categories. So each team will be rated on how technical, original and practical their idea is and how easy it is to use for their intended audience. And uh, because we recognize that these four categories may not be enough for um, everything, we also have a general category that we like to call the wow factor that helps us sort of uh, do a catch all for anything that we may have missed. And before I go into 
our, our demos, I want to emphasize that this is not a competition. Uh, the hackers are very much here to learn. Uh, they're here to share their excitement. Uh, and the judges are here in particular to give feedback on what they uh, see as their projects and how they can take it to the next level, whether it's uh, improving things or using a whole different uh, technology that might be available now that abstracts a lot of their work. But it's very much a session for us to celebrate what everybody's been able to accomplish over the past month. And I just kind of want to point this out again, not everybody is here to uh, become a business. So um, the goal is, again, experimentation and education. And we're, we're showcasing what everybody is uh, learning to, uh, to play with these technologies. So with that, uh, the schedule for today is going to be that these teams are presenting to our judges and uh, doing the hard job are our three judges. Uh, we have Mintia from Consensus Labs. We have Raul from Protocol Labs. And we have Danny Zuckerman from Ceramic Network. And they'll be with us for the next uh, two hours uh, looking at and commenting on uh, the amazing projects that we're going to see today. And uh, with that, I'd like to call up on our very first demo of the day. And uh, I'll let the parcel team take it away and uh, showcase what they did for this hackathon. Sharon, I think we're uh, we're not getting the audio if this is playing. You may want to just quickly check off the audio flag on the screen share, and then we'll be able to get everything. File one, and Brand is the front end David Pass. We're using deterministic signatures with it. Hello and welcome to the. Sorry guys, just so one second. I don't know what's going on. Uh, we're still not getting the audio, so what we can do is, uh, if Josh, you're on our smart contract development, Tarun handles integration. Hello and welcome to the Parcel demo. Parcel is a service to manage crypto payroll seamlessly with end-to-end -end encryption using IPFS and Filecoin. We're a team of three. I am Anubhav and I handle smart contract development. Tarun handles integration with IPFS and Filecoin and Brennan is the front-end dev at Parcel. We're using deterministic signatures with Ethereum private keys and storing all the confidential data or documents on IPFS and Filecoin in an encrypted form. We're also enabling money streaming and through money streaming to employees in one click, our aim is to enable employees to be paid in real time, which leads to making payday loans obsolete. We're also enabling mass payouts in one click, irrespective of tokens held by employer or employees. The idea of mass payouts was inspired by my previous hack at Hack Money with the same name. And with this, I'd like to call in Tarun for the demo. Hi, let's try to create an organization. We can set the name for now, Amazon123. So it is asking for the MetaMask pop-up. So it is saying, sign your address to create the encryption key. And this encryption key will be used to encrypt data on IPFS and Filecoin. So we can just sign it now. Now it will ask for the signatures for creating an organization. So now let's create an organization on the smart contract and the ID is submitted. Let's wait for the confirmation. So our transaction is confirmed and we are redirected to our dashboard. So we can go to payroll section and add some department here. So for now we can say we have marketing department, we have engineering department, and we can just create it. So now uh, we'll first calculate the encrypted 
data hash from IPFS and then submit it to smart contract with mapping with the sum index. And once the transaction is confirmed, we'll just can see here the departments. So now we have marketing and engineering department here. Let's go back to the people section and try to add some employees. So now we can submit the request. So you can see the employees are added successfully. Now let's try to run the mass payroll for these employees. So now let's try to run the mass payroll. So in the mass payroll section, as you can clearly see, we have three employees with the salary of 10 DAI and 10 USDC. And we have two options. One is stream and other is pay. Let's try to run through pay first. So what does pay means? Pay simply means we are uh, doing transaction batching under the hood. So in single transaction, we'll be batching up the transactions for all the addresses. And let's try to run the payroll via pay button. I guess we can run the streaming for the same employees. So we have already selected. So let's try to run the stream. And now I want to run the stream uh, for all my employees for let's say another one hour. And I can press stream. So as you can clearly see, the stream has been started for all the employees. And if we can clearly see that 1% of the streaming has been done. And we have one more section here, which is documents. And here you can add your company's confidential documents. So for now, we can add any document, let's say pay slip. It all starts with generating encryption keys by signing a deterministic string using Ethereum private keys, and then encrypting the data with that generated key. Then we send the data to IPFS and Filecoin and store the returned hash in a smart contract wallet owned by the organization. And to fetch all the required information by retrieving the hash from the smart contract and de decrypting the corresponding data locally to run mass payouts on money streaming. Future work includes role management of data and therefore enabling encrypted file sharing within or outside the organization. We're looking to expand our horizon to a full-fledged agile management suite to manage health records, W9, etc. We're also exploring layer two solutions to offer efficient mass payouts and money streaming since gas on layer one is a concerning issue, especially these days, and layer two solutions like VK Sinks offer a relatively better uh, prospect for us. We're also looking forward to making the code stable, bug free, get the contracts audited, and go to mainnet as soon as possible. We're live on, on Fleek as well. Our demo is hosted on Fleek. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Parcel. Uh, so we'll turn over to the judges for comments, feedback, suggestions. Um, I didn't catch the part in the demo where you added people. Can you just talk me through that flow and what were the identifiers for the people and how do they get added to the organization? Uh, sure. So, uh, so, the, so the architecture that we decided for this uh, works like this. Uh, let's say if, if you want to add some people in the organization, we store uh, all the information of the data on IPFS and Filecoin, and we get a corresponding hash, right? So we store that hash in the smart contract, and that's how the transaction works. Uh, so that's that's actually encrypted uh, by the Ethereum private key. So that is deterministically uh, encrypted. Yeah. So just to just to elaborate on that question, just for me to understand. Um, what you're doing is sort of like deriving or calculating a object that represents the entire organization uh, with the employment structure and so on. And this object as you, as it gets modified, it gets changed and you store that object in IPFS and you always keep the smart contract updated with the latest hash, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So just to be specific that makes on sense. the architecture, we have a mapping on a smart contract, which is, so we have, we have index based mapping. So let's say uh, the zero H index is for documents. Uh, the first index is for, let's say, employees. So that way, we have one hash that we need to change all the time. And so there are right. corresponding hashes that we only change uh, in the IPFS directory. Not yeah, so you have multiple top-level objects. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, I think this is um, a, an idea that I personally thought about because, you know, like if you look at how the world operates today, you, you employees are trusting their employers to 
uh, to pay them at the end of the month. And one of the ideals of blockchain in general is to operate a trustless architecture which can, which can operate in a, in a which can operate the world in an automated fashion in, in some way, right? So it does make sense. Um, regarding um, the streaming option or the streaming function that you that you uh, that you demoed, is is there a possibility to keep the stream real time going and flowing as long as the employee is still working with you, or do you have to manually like look forward and book streams, you know, in a look looking forward basis? Um, yeah, so it's it's uh, actually you you uh, for for at this point of time you have to uh, store all the information on the IPFS and then when you call the function right. So we look at an, look at the information on IPFS, but even then uh, while the stream is running, uh, we were planning to have notification subscriptions right. So you can actually subscribe to notifications. So there's a protocol called EPNS, which is basically decentralized notification. So we're trying to integrate with EPNS and, and trying to think of uh, a way to notify uh, employers and employees. Uh, regarding what what all changes uh, that have done, so this is in future they they might just need to update us with with a tap, and then we'll know what what happens then, and then act accordingly in the smart contract level as well. Okay, great. Um, that's that's the time we've got for Q and A. Uh, thank you, Team Parcel. Uh, we're going to move on to the next team today. Um, uh, who are Verona Beam. Uh, Verona Beam, uh, I think you're already on the call. If you want to share your screen and play your video, uh, we can get started. Hello everyone, we are Verona Beam, and this is a presentation for HackFS, a hackathon run by ETH Global. Boroni Bean is a decentralized content delivery network based on IPFS for internet service providers. This is our team, Veronica and David and myself. Let's take a look at how the current model works. Content creators such as Lisa, they need to rely on expensive CDN companies to make sure that their creations are available everywhere. In the meantime, CDN companies force internet service providers to install expensive third-party hardware such as their point of presence servers to make sure that all traffic stay local. Let's take a look how we propose that the model should work. In this model, CDN companies are aren't necessary anymore. Content creators take advantage of BBN and IPFS to publish all the content to the internet service providers right away. In addition, internet service providers they take advantage of the BBN protocol to run caching servers that will be pinning all the content that's been demanded by the customers. All of this while nothing has changed for the customers. They can keep using the internet as they've been doing it before. So how does it work? Bibin has two key pieces, the PIMPAP and the Gateway. The PIMPAP is a service run by creators or publishers that they use to announce and update the list of data objects that they have published, to keep track of the Bibin gateways which they serve the content, and to handle the customer's HTTP request. The Gateway is a service is a service run by the ISPs, and, they, and it subscribes to the Bin Bin Pin Pups. Let's take a look to a live demo. We're going to start looking at the back end. On the left, we're going to be starting the Pin Pup. As you can say, has subscribed to a topic. On the right, we're going to start the gateway. Let's take a look at the configuration files. For a pin pub, each topic has a source directory that it knows where the content is going to be coming, and as well, it has the different gateways that it should be serving the content. For the gateway, it only, only has the subscriptions for the proper topics. As we said, with this a source directory that has been added. Let's see what happens when we, we make a modification to this directory. As well, we look at it, once that modification has been done, the new content identifier has been updated, and the gateway, the gateway which has been listening to the publisher, updates and pins the new content. So let's look at the front end. In this case, we have a, a publisher like Bill Shakespeare. He has his latest, his latest content. For the demo purposes, we have a trace link so we can see what happens when we click on it. Based on the, con on the CID request, uh, it's been handled and it's been forwarded to the proper gateway, depending on the on the on the on the content identifier. If we look for the user, we just have to click on the proper link and it gets the content. 
As we can see, BBN is the best of two approaches. It's compatible with IPFS and untaps the power of fully decentralized content addressable networking. It's an effortless transition for developers. There's a massive degree is not, re is not required for c to debug it. It also has the best of the CDN model, fully maintain full control of, of the content. In addition, it's important to note that it is in the best interest of internet service providers to use BBN servers over CDN companies. For the future, we are very excited about this idea. We wish we have a little bit more of time to work on it, but we hope that with a little more work in the future, this can become something very interesting. If you guys are, inter uh, are interested, please feel free to join us. And thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Brona B. Um, and again, we'll turn over the judges for questions, comments, feedback. So I have a, I have a th that was that was really cool. I have a question regarding to how you associate, as you mentioned in the presentation, that you associate particular content IDs to particular content providers or particular gateways. How do you do? Uh, maybe I misunderstood that part, but if you could elaborate a bit further, how um, how from a given client uh, the request lands on this appropriate gateway server that you believe to already have cached that con content locally. So how it works, it's it's gateway server. It's, it has a configuration JSON file that is been subscribing to its um, pin pub, depending on the publishers. And the publishers get the choice, uh, have the chance to choice to choose which gateway is going to be serving the content. Uh, for example, if it's based on latency or if the circuits, the, the publishers realize that some gateways is not working properly, they can always redirect to the proper gateway and make sure that the customers is getting the content right away. But everything works through, through JSON configuration files. Are there certain types of content or use cases that you think are least well served now by the current CDN model, especially for ISPs that you think um, this is particularly good for? Well, uh, especially for like large files, like if we go to the example of Netflix, for example, that like is it's a streaming service and we have duplicates of the same video all over the network. And I think we believe that there is a waste, especially for CDNs that they use such a very high electric consumption. So we believe that we can remove the amount of duplicates with the, with the help of IPFS. And instead of having to install a CDN for each internet service provider, uh, like a point of presence for each uh, um, service provider, uh, we believe that with IPFS and Boroni being it's, it's possible to, re to completely remove the number of duplicates. Thanks so much for your submission. This is really cool. So is this something that you plan on continuing on? What's next for you guys? Like, and are you planning on supporting it as an open source project? Uh, so for right now, yes, our plan is uh, to continue with, with it and continue as an open source. Uh, maybe in the future, if things take off and things going well, we, we could explore uh, making it a company. But as of right now, uh, we believe that it's best to continue as an open source to have something to get as many people as possible to help us. Can you tell us a little bit more about the team? I think you, you're you working with somebody else. Um, yes, uh, unfortunately, Veronica wasn't able to have to be here. She, she's working full time as well, so she couldn't get the day off from work. But uh, so myself, I'm a, I'm a student at the University of Waterloo in Toronto. I study systems engineering. And Veronica, she's an engineer at Huawei. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Team Verona Beam. Um, always, thank you very much. Uh, excited to see who will present uh, from uh, from Waterloo. Um, mm -hmm. I hope you come to ETH Waterloo someday in the future when we can run them again. Um, okay. Thank you, Team Verona Beam. We're going to call up the next team, uh, which is Zero Swap. Um, I believe you're on the call now. So if you want to share your screen, play your video, we can get started. Hi, welcome to JiraSwap, a decentralized platform that enables collateralized loans for Filecoin and Ethereum. 
via oracle-less time swap burn algorithm. This also has a decentralized chart feature. The team consists of Jay, Rickson, Nandit, and Brahma. We have used three bucks, Alcoin, IPFS, Slate, and Flick to develop the product. Here is the front end to the application. We have the time swap bond protocol. As a user, you can borrow, stake, or lend the money or any any denomination. You can choose a DAI, you can choose Ethereum, you can put a specified redemption date, and you can put a collateral. The collateral could be any denomination. And it could be a wrapped file coin. Once you hit OK, it goes through the authorization through your MetaMask. And once the transaction is complete, you can see your transaction in the dashboard. Like I said, you can borrow, stake, and lend. And here is another example of uh, lending. Uh, in the lending situation, the collateral is a requirement, and, and there is multiple variations to this. And let me show you also the administrative interface where one can log in and uh, to the bond interface to review the transactions. There is also a chat component, the decentralized chat component that would be Sure. So this is the chat system of our application. This has multiple chat rooms that can allow users to either communicate about the collateralized, collateralized loan on TimeSwap or about different DeFi protocols as well. Let me type in a message. So these chat systems are created by three box ghost threads which are peer-to-peer, -peer. so these data are not stored on any centralized server. And the beauty of this is that at least one of the peer needs to be online so that other peers can fetch the messages from it. If all go offline, the messages disappear. We have an inbuilt wallet connected to your wallet provider like MetaMask. Then we have this screen where we are sharing hot news and topics that users can chat about in the chat room. Then this is the page where user can manage their decentralized profile powered by three box. Yeah, so that's pretty much it about our chat system as well. Thank you. Great, thanks, Zero Swap. Uh, and we'll pass it over the judges. This is great. Thank you for your submission. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you intend on sort of pooling initial liquidity by incentivizing people to deposit their fill into your liquidity pools? Yeah, so for that, we have the staking feature. We have all those functions in our smart contract, time swap smart contract that we have created on our own. So the stakers will be there who will be providing liquidity to the uh, pool, and they will earn, div earn dividends on a specified date to provide the liquidity for a specific ERC20 token. So this time swap uh, protocol that we have created. This is Oracle less like others that you will see in the market. They take data from somewhere else, but this is uh, getting all the market interest rates by itself only by seeing how much okay the lenders are willing to lend, how much borrowers are willing to borrow. So that is the price of interest rate is being decided by the market only, not by any external protocol as is done by others. 
and you can you know lend your filecoin tokens in here uh, we are still working on the bridging part but right now we have demonstrated it for uh, wrapped filecoin which is a erc20 token so right now you can lend and borrow or stake any kind of erc20 token pairs on our platform yeah Got it. Are you in terms of the protocol and sort of like the the mechanics, um, the market mechanics? Are you planning to do kind of like a detailed analysis of the game theoretics behind how that Oracle less market would operate? We yeah, don't. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, but you can go forward. No, I was just saying that uh, th this is where uh, we have not included any any game theory aspects of it. Right now, it's basically uh, hinged on the uh, stake that you put. Basically, you, you uh, take a look, you want to, you know, it, it, suppose you want to lend, then you have a, uh, you have a insurance if you're lending, and then if you're borrowing, um, but if you're lending, you want to uh, have a, a collateral, and then if you're, lend, if you're borrowing, you want to have an insurance. So that way, if the borrower cannot pay, then we will sell that insurance. And depending on how much insurance you take, that will determine the uh, the, the APR. So that is a capital. Yeah, we can also add the uh, game theory in further versions as well. Rick, who is our other teammate, he had a full-time job. He's not here right now. He has published the white papers, first version for the time swap as well. Yeah, so, so see, uh, our uh, actual coder is not available uh, for the uh, bond, bond protocol. Um, he, he's the one who developed the whole thing, so he, he's not available today. Okay, got it, thanks. Thanks for that answer. Um, what I was looking for was, you know, the, the acknowledgement that there is a lot more work to do in terms of, you know, designing the, the mechanics of the protocol itself, because it can lend itself to a lot of like manipulation potentially. So definitely you want to, you want to like really, if you want to, if you intend to productize this, you really want to, you really want to dig into that. But, but yeah, this was a really cool submission. Thanks. This is just our also for the chat feature. Yeah. We plan that in further versions, uh, you can directly interact with the protocols via our chat system. Like if you type in, uh, I want to lend 100 file coins for 200 die at, let's say 5% of the interest, or is it decided, the interest is decided by the protocol. So you will be able to do that via our chat system. We are working to you know build some AI models so that it uh, makes up like a chatbot system that is still work in progress. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you team zero swap. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next team. Um, uh, which is ETH Quad. I think we've got you on here already. Uh, I'm going to play your video for you. Um, so let me just get that set up and we'll get started. Uh, sorry, Luke, should there be audio on here? Uh, no, there's no audio. Okay. I just want to make sure I wasn't messing that up. Yeah. Sorry. I'll just, I'll just let it, let it go then. Yeah, uh, I think the wrong screen is playing. Is it possible? Oh, Josh, I think you're playing um, your. I think you're sharing your screen. Uh, I'm sorry. There's no video showing. Hey, 
Yeah, nothing nothing was playing there. Sorry, guys. Okay. Do you see a video now? That's that's yeah, entirely on my bad. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah. Oh, if you can start from, from about one and a half minutes into it. Sure. I'll jump in there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so, so this was truly a hack. Um, I was trying out Filecoin and, and all the different uh, tools. So I basically got, um, I got the, the latest Filecoin running, um, got, got the Docker, Docker containers all, all running. That was all, all there for me, just what I needed. Um, and, then, and then I basically integrated that into a, a, a front-end React with, um, with a back-end, uh, Node.js Express back-end. Um, just in case, just because the idea was that I wanted to, I wanted to inter, 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 integrate um, ETH 2.0, um, and I, I wanted to protect the keys for that. Um, so that was basically why I had had a separate separate backend. Um, so what you can see there is, uh, all, all I'm really doing in this demo is 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 going through the slate um, guide, which was actually part of the the workshops that I went through. Um, but yeah, I guess some of the things that that I was I was happy with was um, uh, going through with the was the, um, yeah integrating the unstoppable unstoppable domains with Pinata. That was pretty um, pretty interesting seeing how that all worked because I hadn't actually done any of that before. Um, so basically writing a script and discovering other people who'd who'd done who got involved in that before as well. Um, and then and then having the going through redirecting it from say a traditional Heroku application through to an IPFS and then redirecting that again to, to another, um, to uh, the unstoppable, unstoppable domains website or an IPFS hash. Um, yeah, so what's happening now, that video. Yeah, so you can see it's, I've created a redirection there that was necessary to go through the IPFS hash. And then if you scroll down the screen, it basically shows, well, just, it's just showing the a quick API query to the back end. So that was pretty much in a nutshell what I managed to put together in the time frame. Um, And then I'm just basically showing through, showing the different um, steps or scripts that I put together. And that was just a screenshot. So I've got a few, a few different pins there. I've got a, a production and a development um, pin on, on, um, on Pinata. And it basically unpins the ones that I don't need using the script. And it takes a, it was taking a while to 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 redirect to the site from that Heroku app for some reason. Yeah, so it eventually takes us to a redirection page, and then that redirection page takes us to the IPFS hash. And then the idea there is that is the um, the web page is querying the the latest um, yeah okay so we'll pass over the judges I'm glad that you that you got to experiment with a bunch of things and so and so like you know mix and mash a bunch of like yeah. ecosystem projects together you know it's it's really cool to see people you know experimenting and like you know uh, having their juices flowing and like throwing out 
things to see what they what they managed to do. This was pretty cool. I was curious if you could uh, if you could maybe talk us through some of the aha moments that you had when you were you know like navigating all these all these technologies and like you know linking them together and so on. What what were the things that actually made it all fit together in your head? Um, well, I, I think when I when I when I discovered the script, uh, someone I uh, I can't recall who who put it together. It might have been Textile, but there was yeah there was a Docker container which basically spun up. Um, it spun up the PowerGate. It spun up the the Lotus, um, Filecoin, and and basically all the different. Um, what else was there? It also spun up. Uh, but yeah, basically spun up all four, all four Docker containers that that all interacted together, and that was basically all I had to query to to use the the front end slate interface. Um, whereas I guess if I had to do that manually myself, it probably would have taken me a lot longer. So um, I don't know if that's necessarily an aha moment, but um, that was was quite quite interesting just to go through and see how that was done, um, and also. Um, just understand like the, the pin, the pinning process. So I, I went through and um, yeah, basically pinning and unpinning and, and realizing that, that um, in like I basically I was, I was um, building the website in development and then I'd have to deploy that to production and having a, a separate IPFS address for each one for my workflow. Um, so that was, I guess, an aha moment that, I actually needed a separate development and production environment and a separate IP, IPFS just to preview what it would actually be like in production, as opposed to um, that was basically part of, part of, part of the workflow um, issues that I had. Um, and, and it was also interesting, interesting looking through unstoppable domains and, and actually looking at through how that was um, um, the, the just discovering the transaction on Ethereum and seeing where that was um looking at the smart contract and seeing if i could um how i could do that manually like the, the transactions manually and all that kind of stuff um and and just chatting in the in the forum and seeing how other people were were tackling similar similar issues as well so that was quite interesting that's really cool it would be awesome if you could like contribute back to the community your learnings and in, in the form of like you know code or even blog posts on you know kind of like the story of how you integrated these things i think it would be super valuable but yeah thanks thanks for this yeah i think i think that was really hand like i, I basically created a checklist and i actually felt that, that was really handy for myself as well so anyone who goes to my repository they can sort of see where it got up to and if they wanted to sort of take it further or or borrow it and just use it for their own that's that was the i guess the key and see see what what's next you know so i guess it'd be nice to to actually work on the the quadratic sort of governments that was I guess something yeah, that's down the pipeline as well. Great. Okay. Thank you, Ethquad. Thank you, Luke. Um, sorry again for the, the video screw up there. Um, we're going to move on to the next team now, uh, which is Hyben. Um, uh, so I'm going to play the video again, but I'll get it right this time. And we've also got uh, Ken uh, on, the, on the line with us as well, who's going to translate um, for the Q&A portion. Um, so let me get this set up and then we'll get started. Okay, me. Thank you. Okay, everyone can see that, right? Great. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to introduce our team on the our project. We are students from East China Normal University at the Beijing Forest Free University. Representing a uh, Haven Network Technology Company to participate in this Hexen. Most of the members of our team are undergraduates and graduate students who are studying the direction of the blockchain. This is our team, and uh, this is the our Spurnison company, Haven Technology. Our project is the item traceability system based on the IPFS and the, the Ethereum. <laughs> when we build this the project um, during the COVID-19 epidemic, the traceability of the item is becoming more and more important. 
Although some people have made the blockchain-based item traceability system, it is either based on the consortium chain or the problem of the preserving of the large amount of the data has not been resolved. This project is based on IPFIs as the SRM. It spurs the company information and the item information to ensure that the large amount of information is stored on IPFIs. <coughs> Those uh, our project uh, serves the uh, the a large number of the data storage problem. The project uh, wide uh, uh, smart the contracts to ensure the complete safe the execution of the date exercise. As uh, then finds the information of the item in IPFIs and then uses uh, recursive the algorithm to recuse the parent item of the problem item from the Instituderm and IPFIs and finally from the DAG. <coughs> this is the all world flow chart. And first, we found the IPFI drives through the Instituderm. And then we get a specific the date by accessing the IPFIs from the parent product ID. And the third uh, way, uh, according to this the ID, interact uh, with uh, Instagram um, again to acquire the comparing IPFS drives. And finally, we'll go back to the first step. This is the our demo. Which is the actor? Yeah, we see the list, the item ID, and the, uh, we know the chart, and the one we move the most to the specific item, the parents and the children's note are selected item, a highlight. Okay. And if we are a company, uh, you can also add the production information of the item. Now we select the date. Yeah. And uh, we select the company. Okay. And then uh, we select the, the material ID. Who is the father of the, this product? Okay, we success. <clears throat> and uh, the technology we use uh, is the uh, Instagram inferring and the IPFIs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Team Hyben. Um, so yeah, we'll open it up to the judges for any questions, comments, feedback. Uh, okay, I need an uh, interpreter, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we've got Ken on the line. Hi, I'm uh, here. From the Ethereum Foundation. Hey, Ken. Yes, I'm here. Do we have any oh. questions? Sorry. Yeah, sure. I'm going to give my Mandarin a shot, actually. Um, Wow,你的中文这么好的呀。<笑> 然后呃因为这个项目有点紧然后我们就做的比较呃粗糙如果再让我们加的话我们会加入那个 
，呃，跟密码学相关的一些，嗯、呃、嗯、呃，比如像身份认证，然后呃，看看能不能加入那个呃企业那个信息的差分隐私，那个呃差分隐私英语怎么说？那个嗯、呃、，privacy privacy differing difference OK。呃，然后呃，呃，这些东西吧，这这就是我们大致的构想，嗯，谢谢你，谢谢。All right. Um, it's possible that I might ask the same question because I didn't, I didn't actually catch much of what you said. Uh, Sorry, Raul.、Well, I, I, I asked if they, if they had more time, what else would they have added to their project in terms of features? And、uh, they mentioned sort of identification verification,、uh, amongst other things. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, my question, uh, Kenneth, is about, uh, whether they've estimated. The cost of storing and changing this data and the references to the data on the Ethereum blockchain, like given a particular tracing history of a particular item, say you know if it has like thirty entries or forty entries, how much would it cost to continue you know sending transactions to Ethereum in terms of the transaction cost, the gas, the gas fee, and the you know the the storage cost itself. Which percolates as gas. <laughs> that was.、Uh, I don't. I don't know if I can do that. I think Min is is her Chinese is much better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so how many? If um, you you uh Ethereum, 比较多一点，这个 transaction cost, um. 会不会 ？What is it? It's if we do thirty to forty transactions. So an item with maybe thirty or forty forty、uh, tracing entries. Like, what would be the cumulative cost of you know the of tracking the history of that item? Okay, so thirty to forty transactions. Um, 会啊。几贵？贵什么？他是说，呃，延迟，延迟还是什么东西？延迟？啊，不是，他是说三十到四十的 transaction， 然后是什么？啊<笑><笑>、um, ，What What was the transactions? What What are we doing? You say tracing calls? Ah,、uh, tracing calls. I don't know how to trace the goals. Let's try this tracing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is right either. Google Translate says, "Very strong, 电话 That's not right. I don't know how to translate that one. That's hard. Actually, I might be able to figure it out by looking at the at the source code. Ah,、uh, so." 呃，用那个 transaction， 呃，交易，呃，交易是吗 ？OK， <笑> sorry， 呃，呃，好像好像那个那个问题是，嗯，那个中字花费，嗯，从嗯、um, beginning to end 是多少？哦，那个 time 吗 ？Team。呃、uh, ，time time 花费吗 ？Time spend 不是是钱，钱花费。哦、oh, ，钱花费。对啊。I forget. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I've upset a lot of people with that question. Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> 没关系，谢谢你。啊，好的。<笑> okay, okay. Well, there's no more questions.、Uh, thank you so much, Team Hyben, for 
bearing with us here. And thank you, Ken. Uh, Ken's going to stay on for the next one as well, uh, where we're also going to have a translator. Um, so up, up next, we've got uh, team TJ Wallet Light. Um, so I, I will play your video for you. Uh, I understand that there's no audio for the video. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll play that, um, we'll view it, and then we'll have Q&A Q &A afterwards. All right, give me a moment to get the set up and then we'll be rolling. Mm. Uh, okay, we have the team, uh, TG Wallet Light uh, from China. Uh, then I will, sh oh yeah, 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 it's the video. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, so I'll play this and then we can do a Q and A. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Oh, maybe I can introduce you uh, the TG Wallet uh, light. Uh, I find the video is no sound. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, this is the. Uh, Do you want to speak over the video? That's fine if you want to, but I'll just keep it playing. Uh, uh, King, can you help me translate? Hello, King. He wants to, so he's just showing the video and showing uh, how this, how it works. Do you want him to, how do you want him to do this? You want him to talk through it? Uh, I just want to play the video. If they want to speak over the video while it plays, that's fine. Or, you know, we can just watch the video. Um, you can just watch over video first. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, How do we?
Great. Okay. Thank you, TJ Wallet. Uh, so yeah, we'll pass it over to the judges and, and Ken can help transit as before. Um, Okay, so this is this is their their custom made file coin wallet. Um and it includes uh mail it. 我試下,不如我試下用英文盡量,好不好?你看我。We have the uh, blockchain wallet before, and now we just made a Fancon wallet just for you guys, and uh, this is, uh, um, how to say that, customized. And uh, it, uh, also we have the hardware wallet. This is the first. Uh, second, you can see we have the, a lot of information uh, like fine coins on other blockchain information um, inside. And uh, uh, we this all the information, the data, we uh, back up, the, we, we set the, this and then we, how to say that, save this data on the IPFS. You know, just we use the IPFS technology to uh, make this void. This is second. And the third, and the, you can see we have a lot of DAPPs, uh, over 3,000 uh, inside. And uh, so we build um, a developed tools SDK to um, connect uh, DAPP and to find coin. You know. uh, we also have, uh, I, I, we, I think there is a lot of uh, 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 APP or webs Games or other, how to say that, other um, programs want to join Fine Combat, how to uh, get in. So we build a state SDK to let them assess, and then they can uh, work with us together. Um, nice. <clears throat> that's that's very cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. The any questions? Yeah. Just ask. Yeah, presentation was a bit blurry for me, but the UI looked pretty pretty cool. Um, uh, are you planning to allow people to do transactions, wallet transactions as well? And if yes, um, how are you? Do you have an idea on how to mo how to make the UI um, a model the payment channels that Filecoin has. So Filecoin has this concept of payment channels. Um, and you know, you can send vouchers and you can settle a payment channel and so on. So I don't know if you've thought about the UX flow of how that would work. How about Filecoin? Ah, Kuman Kuman Filecoin you you know payment channels so I Um 我們已經可以做了,即是我們的 So he says um the transaction flow is actually there. Um, and it looks like a normal transaction. So he has a high quality video. It just, I guess it, it just didn't load well. Do you remember we have a water uh, we, we have a faucet to get file, right? The file con, right? And the, in our wallet, we also do that. Uh, we can let the people, uh, how to say that? Uh, how to say that? How to say that? Walk,吹到呢個,wallet,呃,fancon,wallet,呃,fancon,like,授權佢登錄。我,我的fossil,個啲錢。係啊,即係我哋係,即係普通嚟講,你放個地址入去得㗎,但係我而家係叫授權,
邊個講錯啊？嚇！佢哋 approve 個個 faucet。係。Okay, so he said the faucet's already baked in the wallet. It's just, uh, it's, uh, I guess it pings your server. You guys have to approve the faucet, uh, and then it goes to their wallets, and they're able to transact directly through their wallet. 係啦，已經有㗎啦。跟住係誒 ，in the in the future we we will help the 誒、uh, Fincon user to 誒、uh, 授權點講 author 係嘛 ？Approve faucet. Approve approve the approve the their uh, uh, file account to 誒、uh, how to say that to send a、uh, transactions or 誒、uh, prove the Web at、uh, the web、uh, or at the app to get the information that they want to, they want to give them. Also, all, all this is, is already in our SDK. They have it, but you, you, you. I mean, the video is not very clear, so we didn't see it. And if you can download our APK, you can you can see it. Already. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you so much.、Um, so I think you have seen the chat. We're going to take a five-minute break now.、Uh, so a chance to、uh, use the washroom. Judges, take some notes. Um, uh, thanks again,、uh, TJ Wallet.、Uh, and yeah, see you all back in a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kenneth. <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> We got a free Mandarin and Canto lesson. <laughs> I need, I need. <laughs> But thanks for having me. Thanks for considering me.、Uh, sorry, sorry to put you in the top spot like no, 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 a few no, no. times. I, I, I volunteered for this. It's、um, I wish I was better. <laughs> Not a shame.、Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop off. But、uh, good luck with judging. Have fun. I'll see y'all soon.
Okay, hello everyone. I think we can get back now. Uh, judges, uh, let me know when you are back on the video. All right, we got Min. We got Danny. So I'm I'm here, but my video seems to be blocked for some reason. So you stop <laughs> <Okay>. it. Or... <laughs> Uh, okay, well, we'll see if we can get it working, but maybe it says we'll, we'll you can't start your time. video because it says you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Interesting. Um, I don't believe that I did that, but let me see if I can. Uh... All right. I did, I did that. Sorry. Works now. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I got it. Sorry about that. Thanks. My audio is also way quieter. Is that just me or did that happen to you guys too? Just me? Okay. Sounds okay for me. But by, by the way, uh, Josh, I don't know if it happened to everybody, but uh, the screen was the screencast was a bit blurry in the last two presentations or three presentations. Mm, okay. I don't know if it's like a bandwidth problem on my end or your end or something. Yeah, else. I uh, I'm not sure. I've got a lot of stuff going on because we have like multiple videos loading all at once, so it may just be an unavoidable bandwidth issue, unfortunately. Um, these videos uh, are available uh, on the showcase um, and I can save the links afterwards and anyone that's watching this that wants to see the higher quality videos, uh, if you go to the Hackafest showcase, there's all the video links, all the repos, everything there. Uh, okay, so uh, next up uh, we have uh, Upala Digital Identity. Uh, I think that I'm going to play this video again uh, for you, Peter, um, so I'll get that set up and then we'll get started. Greetings humans, we are Upala, an anti-civil system for the apps and the decentralized identity of the future. Today there is no reliable way to tell humans apart from bots on Ethereum, neither there is on the traditional web. And in Upala we believe that over 1 billion people without any ID is a part of the same unique human problem. Existing solutions out there measure the probability of personhood in percents. We don't do that in Upala. Instead, our account score represents how much it would cost to forge this account. We have dollars instead of percent. Let's see how it works. The first concept is a group. Users join a group, they put their deposit in a group pool, and the group assigns scores to all of its users. Notice that the score is higher than the deposit. This is where the second concept comes in, Explosive Bots Protocol. It ensures that anyone can delete their ID at any time and grab an amount of money corresponding to their score. Here, a malicious user is able to get $10 uh, from the pool. Sure enough, other members will feel betrayed and they will not let this person in again. The third concept is stacking. The same way users join groups, groups gather into hierarchies. Superior groups may require deposits from east subgroups and in turn add extra scores to their users, but the same scores will be paid as a reward to an exploding attacker. Group at the top may, require, may acquire large audiences this way and they may then charge the apps for providing user scores or they may earn interests on their huge pools. And the last concept is pass. Both an attacker or a good user need a membership path through the group hierarchy to prove their scores. These four concepts incentivize groups to gather large, low explosion risk audiences, and users are incentivized to get the highest scores for the lowest investment of money or reputation. The market similar to insurance emerges, but instead of trading coverage for premium, in Upala, scores are traded for deposits. The user scores then roughly represents the efforts needed to acquire such a score, or the price of forgery, and it is a very reliable metrics for the apps to assess human uniqueness with. Upala is a protocol, a variety of identity systems can be built with it, like the one based on friendship, or on DAO membership. It can even wrap over multiple identity systems and communities, enabling scores that die higher than a black market uh, cost of a state ID, so it has a potential to become a substitute for that. And yep, that's our goal. Uh, but for now, we made this minimal viable anti-civil system. The top group is the Blade Runner. The other groups are entry tests that auto-assign scores to members of existing DAOs, and Aragon based DAO can change the scores and decide 
uh, to add groups with other entry conditions. Let's see how it works. So first, we, we register an ID. Uh, then we join a group. We are a member of MediCartel, so this group lets us in. No problem. So if we join, and now Blade Runner assigns us a score of 15 die. Let's change the score. Okay, we now have 20, 20 die score. Now notice the Blade Runner bell balance and our uh, ID. So we're gonna explode now. That means delete our ID forever. Now let's register a new ID, an empty one. We don't have anything, we cannot join any groups, and we can see that the Blade Runner dial balance is decreased. So this is how it works. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Okay. Pass over the judges for feedback and comments. Hey. Hello, everyone. Hey, Peter. Um, this is awesome. We literally were just having a conversation a few weeks ago about how someone needs to try something like this. So very excited to see this project. Um, <laughs> so a couple of questions. Um, the first one um, is the, are you guys using Ethereum keys as the identity or is there an abstraction away from that that um, lets you use it across different networks um, beyond just like the Ethereum network? Uh, we use Ethereum keys to access your ID. Uh, so uh, an ID has a owner, which is represented by an Ethereum key. Uh, but uh, if, uh, I think that Upala could be blockchain agnostic, so we can use any any blockchain for that. And so where is, you said the ID has an owner, where is that stored? Uh, currently, it's stored in the smart contract in the protocol, in the Apollo protocol. It assigns a permanent uh, user ID to, to users and to groups. Got it. And have you thought about as you start to, if you use a smart contract and are linking to Ethereum keys and then have users as part of multiple groups, um, are there privacy concerns about what users have to be disclosing publicly in order to get this kind of coverage? Sure. Great, great question. Yeah, we we are concerned with that a lot. Uh, uh, well, basically, I'm not sure yet how to handle it, but I think it's possible in the future with probably some zk snarks <laughs> magic. Uh, but currently, we uh, we are focused to deliver the MVP, so uh, this is out of our focus right now. So I think that staking on identity um, and group identity is a really cool idea. Um, it's very original. Um, kudos, kudos on that. Um, how would you, so exploding is one way to exit the group. Um, and it's kind of like the rage quit, I guess, or kind of like, hey, I'm going to take like the, you know, the lucky part or whatever. Um, how, would, how would you deal with organic, you know, with natural, you know, uh, rotation in that group? So if a particular member really does leave a group that represents a collective identity and this is genuine, how would you deal with that? Yeah, that, there are two different ways that you can leave a group. You can ex either explode or you can leave peacefully. <laughs> so uh, without explosion. Uh, so explosion means that you grab, uh, that you are stealing uh, from the pool. And as opposed to that, just uh, simple leaving or you are leaving either taking your deposit or nothing at all it the group will decide what what the leave, leaving peacefully conditions are okay uh, well, if there's no other questions or comments on the judging panel uh we'll move on to the next team uh, thank you, uh, Team Paula. Thank you, Peter. Um, really awesome to see this project. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, speak Archivator, uh, you are up. I see you in the chat. 
So um, unlike the last four, uh, this time you're going to play the video. Um, so I'll let you take it away. Uh, I don't hear any audio, Robert. You can hear the audio. Uh, no, we don't hear the audio at all. Um, you might have to uh, stop the share and then restart the share and click the button in the bottom left corner of that dialog box. Let me try it again. All right. Uh, so, we are team speech so we are the team and speech archivator, and this is what we have built for the Hick FS Hackathon. My name is Robert, and I build this project with my friend Tian. And we build a program that uploads, and videos, build that program that uploads videos that contain a specific person to IPFS. And we build this because of the problems that are emerging from deepfake technology. Deepfakes are videos or images that look exactly like real ones, but they are artificially generated. So, for example, you can have a video of some president talking about starting a war, but you have no idea if this video is real or if it's, or, or if it's artificially generated. So, for that reason, we came with an idea to record speeches of influential people and save them to IPFS, so that we have a record of the of what the person said in history. And how it works? It uses artificial neural networks to perform face detection in the videos. When we find the faces, we cut out video segments that contain the specified face, and then we can upload these video chunks to IPFS. And now it's the demo time. All right, so on the right side is the project, and on the left side is the video in which we want to find Donald Trump speaking. It's a video from the Telegraph about Donald Trump and the coronavirus. You see that at the beginning, there's some background footage which is not very interesting for us but about 20 seconds later Donald Trump starts his speech about coronavirus and our goal is to cut out this part where Donald Trump is talking about coronavirus and get rid of the beginning where no action is going on. So let me run the script to process the video. This is the part where face recognition, face recognition algorithms are trying to find Donald Trump's face in the video and cut out the interesting segments. And this takes about a few minutes, it depends on the size of the video. All right, the video was processed, and if I play the processed video... Which is Donald Trump's speech. Now we can upload, upload this file. And now we can upload this, upload this file to IPFS. So let me run the script to upload file to IPFS. I'm I'm running IPFS server in the background. And before since video files can be very big files, it's a good idea to split the video into smaller chunks. So that's what what's going on right now. I will split this video into three small smaller videos and then upload it. Okay, so we split the video into three parts and then upload it. And here's the IPFS web user interface. And if I if I refresh it, I see there are three files now. And these are the three video chunks I just uploaded a few seconds ago. And we, if we want to retrieve the video back, we can use this hash, which is basically hash of the video content. This so this was our project, Speech Archivator, and thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. Uh, so yeah, we open up the judges for comments and feedback. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, I think uh, you know, with <laughs> you definitely used a very controversial person uh, that says a bunch of things, and we probably want to like as as um, humanity want to archive some of those bits uh, for posterity and for for track.
for accountability and for traceability in the future. Um, I can see like a lot of, you know, such cases. Um, it's, uh, are you thinking about automating in some way? I guess this is kind of like the start of a project, but uh, like, what are your thoughts on like making this a fully automated, you know, bot or system that would spider, you know, streams on YouTube or whatever and detect the, the faces that you're interested in and pipe them onto IPFS and maybe like use IPNS to sort of like, and things like, you know, pop subsistence and so on to advertise whenever a new video has been uploaded for a specific person that users are interested in consuming. Like, what are your thoughts on automating the whole process? Yeah, for, for now we are trying to look, we are, we are tracking a YouTube channel of ch channels of some famous like magazines like CNBC, BBC and this kind of stuff. And we, what we want to do is to look for live videos and get the, get the interesting faces like some famous politicians from it. So that's our goal. We are still having some problems with it. So for now we just can, we have, we have a script which checks periodically for new videos on some YouTube channel and then process it. But yeah, our goal for now is to make it work live with the live videos, not just the just upload it, but the live ones. Yeah. So that's the most that's our goal for the future. And then like make some and then of course make some big, bit better front end for the users, which can like pick up the person they are interested in and some some time, some time period or this kind of stuff, or some events like promotion speech of president of presidents in United States between years 2010 and 2015 or something like that. This is super cool and um, thank you for your submission. Um, and how do you sort of ensure that, you know, on like, you know, the counterpoint to this, that it's not used for any sort of surveillance or any sort of unintended consequence? It doesn't sort of contravene any privacy concerns Yes, that might. This is a thing to be solved. Actually, like, there might be some privacy concerns, like about the people tracked. So, yes. But for now, like, uh, we want to use it not for like personal use, but really for the pres U.S. presidents and this kind of stuff. And they are already on the TV, on television in these days. So, I don't think it's it will be such a big problem for like these very famous people who are used to be on the TV on camera. But there has to be some proof that this really is like what they said and it's not modified in any way. So this has to be so definitely. Okay. Like it would be cool if there was some like camera which you could use it like camera connected with blockchain cryptography that what was what was filmed on that camera is really like the truth. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Robert. Thank you, uh, Speech Archivider. Um, we're gonna call up the next team now for their presentation, uh, which is Secured Finance. Uh, I believe you're on the call now. So if you want to share your screen, play your video, uh, we'll get started. And remember to click that uh, audio share button. Hi everyone, we will talk about a DeFi project called Secured Finance. Secured Finance is a financial transaction platform with automatic margin call system. So what are financial transactions? It's simply a collection of future cash flows. Please remember this shape. I'll go over four examples. Loans are basic form of all complex transactions. You borrow money and you have to pay coupons and return the money at the end. If we flip the arrow, a loan becomes a deposit. Interestingly, if you combine a loan and deposit, you can make a swap transaction. It is a cross-currency swap. Option is even simpler. It's just a conditional swap. If we can do loan, we can do others too. So our main focus is Filecoin loan. Our target user would be miners, investors, hedgers, and arbitragers. Why we made this project? Since IBM and the World Bank did the first cross-currency swap, we have accumulated knowledge for almost 40 years. So we already have battle-tested protocol for finance. And if you use the same protocol, all of the traditional financial institutions can join us quite easily. OTC derivatives is peer-to-peer -peer and has $600 trillion of size. We made the interbank market system 
and open to public. We aim to gain 1% of market share, but more conservatively, we are aiming to bring $1 trillion into crypto economy. What's missing in the current DeFi is clear, volume and liquidity. We can't sell 10 million Ether through an exchange. Also, we are missing time access. Because we don't have yield curve, we can't manage the future cash flow, and that's why large corporates are slow. So we are making a new market and opportunities. We also have liquidity provided with incentive mechanism to keep the bid offer spread tight and ensure liquidity. Our mission is to connect institutions and provide open finance. Our clients can provide secondary layer services to their clients. As an example, if a bank wants field deposit but a client deposits Ether, they can do a cross-currency swap. Let's talk about how we built it. Key components are built using smart contracts. So we created these three smart contracts and designed at state machines. Here's a sequence diagram stored in our Git repository. For margin call, our contract calculate discount factors and get PV. To avoid margin call, borrowers need to keep 150% coverage. Here's our UI components. We don't need to log in. Lastly, here's pros and cons of our service. We provide zero credit risk transaction. Because we have yield curve, clients can control the future value of cash flows. Thank you very much, and here's our demo. SecuredFinance.Crypto is a decentralized app deployed on IPFS using Flick. Here we have Money Market, Swap, FX, Book, History, and Filecoin page. First, we will go to Book in order to set FX and Loan. After filling out all these input fields, let us set FX. Let's confirm. Let's now set loan book. Confirm. When we head back to money market, we can see the values we set on borrowers and lenders tables. To lend, we select a row from borrowers, click lend and enter amount and confirm. Next, we will go to history to see the list of loans and borrows we made. Here we can search, sort, and filter our entire loan book. We can also pin our table to IPFS with Pinata Cloud. And the last one to see is Filecoin page where we generate token, create Filecoin address, and send it. And this will complete state of our loan. Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you, Secured Finance. Uh, we'll turn over the judges for feedback and comments. This is really cool and oh go ahead man. sure um you know i love the ui as well and it's great that you guys built that um during the duration um could you talk to like you know explain a little bit what you're using for price feeds and how you're sort of managing any sort of price volatility or fill as well Sure. Uh, so speaking about the uh, Oracle problem, uh, so in terms of Oracles, we thought about using outside price sources. Uh, from Coinbase or Kraken at the beginning. However, their price is not executable because uh, lacking of liquidity. So we decided to build suitable market for large size transactions and made ourselves as price oracle. So we don't need to rely on external sources. And also for Filecoin balance, currently it is manual and the transaction hash and confirmation basis but we're building lib P2P based Filecoin Oracle to automate this process. So let our teammate back to speak about this. Yeah, uh, one of the main problems between Filecoin and Ethereum is uh, how do we handle interoperability? In order to solve this problem, we've, we, we actually uh, created a peer to peer based peer to peer Oracle network, which is kindly uh, working uh, as a way as you might think about Chainlink. Instead of uh, using a Chainlink, uh, scheme where one node has its own uh, set of smart contracts on Ethereum chain. We have peer-to-peer uh, -peer nodes, which is uh, messaging to each other using Popsa, 
And then the leader of a consensus layer, uh, right now we're using Raft consensus, but we're planning to migrate to a practical BFT consensus, going to commit to the Ethereum uh, blockchain as the state from, from the file coin. And that's how we're achieving the interoperability between two networks. Yeah, so speaking about the motivation, it is actually the original idea came from uh, 100 hackathon idea by one. And actually I talked, uh, I drafted the sketch and talked with him and he liked it and then decided to join this hackathon and uh, try to help uh, Filecoin ecosystem because we are very much worried about Filecoin price fluctuation. That's because like there's no place to trade large amount of currency. So we make the block trade platform to make the price much more stable and help to grow healthy economy. Okay, uh, if there's no other questions from the judges or comments, um, uh, thank you, um, thank you team. And, and we'll bring up the, uh, the next one for the presentation. Um, so next up, we've got uh, access underscore denied. Uh, and I understand that I'm gonna play your video for you. Um, so let me just get that set up and we'll get started. Thank you, access denied. And um, we'll pass it over to the judges for feedbacks, questions, comments. Hey, I really, I really like the music of that presentation. It was really upbeat. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool to to create tools uh, 
to connect uh, to create marketplaces so that uh, folks can connect with one another and sort of like improve their skills and also you know earn prices. That's pretty cool. It would be um, would be interesting. Uh, there is uh, it would be interesting to see kind of like the the whole workflow uh, where you know potentially one adapt is sorry that's some let it pass for a second. Sorry for that. No, <laughs> Yeah, uh, like imagine, you know, a DAP is, is particular, is, um, is approved. It would be really cool to like, be able to like deploy to production immediately uh, by deploying the smart contracts that are associated, right? And potentially deploying the website on Fleek, uh, which goes to IPFS and so on. I don't know if you guys have thought about, you know, what comes after the, the approval of a DAP. Oh yeah, we have actually thought of like, uh, 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 like, uh, deploying it in the unstoppable uh, domain so that uh, like it can go uh, live right away that's the main motive but right now we are also thinking of uh, making it further improvements so, so, so including staking so that uh, there will be decent behavior in a platform so that's the main motive and also to make it production ready that's a key end, end point And also we could show a small demo if you want, like, because the whole demo, we tried to put it in the video and turned out to be out of 25 minutes. So we had to cut short on the video timing. Yeah, that, that actually be really cool. I don't know, Josh, what do you think? Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes. So, uh, you know, if it's just a, a, a minute or so, that, that's no problem. We got about two and a half oh, minutes we can left just, of your time. Yeah, we can just show the profiles uh, present in a platform. Okay. My team and Mona Alicia will present the screen. Yeah, so can you see my screen? Or uh, am I am I audible clearly? Yep. Both yep. things, yes. All good. Yeah, okay. So this is the like I've logged in as a solver, so I can see the solve button. Yeah. So this is the profile, like I can see the questions that are being uploaded. If I click on solve, I'll get the uh, dialogue for uploading my smart contact and giving the readme file and uh, now i can show you the pro publisher profile so if i'm logged in as a publisher yeah so this is the publisher profile where you can where you can upload a question there are two options you can either upload uh, opt for a smart contract or for a dap plus smart contract he has the reward that you can select for the smart content and DAP and uh, there is a time limit and these are the uh, questions that he has uploaded for now. Uh, this is the DAP. Only one solution is being uploaded for that question so he gets this and if he clicks on approve this is the next screw contract that we have initiated. For this question this was completed so like the publisher will first initiate the escrow so he can uh, chat with the DAP uh, person who has uploaded the solution and then after the DAP person like he clicks on ownership transfer like he transfers ownership he'll get a the publisher will come to know about that and uh, he can confirm the payment that is reward distribution to the DAP so this is how uh, the stages are after submission of a solution and uh, for voting so if I'm a voter, this voting part is only for the smart contracts, but for the DAPs, the publisher has the right to choose which DAP he wants to approve, as I showed you in the previous uh, page to the escrow. So if I click on vote, I'll get these. There are no solutions uploaded. So if I if there are solutions, there will be like like and dislike button. So a voter can like or dislike a solution. Yeah, so, and this is the get roles portion where anyone can get a role, publisher, solver, DAP, or a voter, because if he doesn't have any role, he cannot, uh, like, he can just see the questions. He'll not get any interactive buttons on our platform. So, so this was the, like, quick demo of our platform. And uh, for the DAP profile, we also have a DAP profile. Uh, yeah, so if I 
Yeah, this is the DAP login. Yeah, so there's a DAP profile where you can see the DAP that the solver has uploaded. If he clicks on view, there's a escrow contract. This initiate button can only be done by the publisher because he'll select which DAP he wants to approve. Ownership transfer is done based by this DAP person and uh, the confirmed payment will be done by the publisher. So these buttons are placed according to that. Yeah. This was the... All right, we're, we're a little over time now, Monalisha, so I'll probably have to stop yeah, you there. Yeah. Um, but sure. uh, th thank you for the demo uh, and thank you team access denied. Um, so we're gonna move on to the, the next team up. Um, that is uh, censorship, uh, censorship resistant web annotations. Uh, I believe you're on the call already, um, and uh, I'll let you uh, play your video, and we'll get started. Okay, I'll play the video now. Hello, everyone. This is our demo of the Public Annotations Network. We build this because social media websites can censor data. They can delete or mutate content. People can block you. There are tons of ways that you can be censored today. Um, and every day, society becomes more dependent on these centrally controlled platforms. Web annotations are a nice way to promote discourse by enhancing web pages. Uh, and they are also a W3C recommendation. So using web annotations on top of IBFS and Ethereum, um, we can reduce the censorship attack factor. So let's now go to a quick demo, and then we can explain how all of this works. So here I am on Twitter, and I already have the pen web extension installed, which is signaled by this yellow pen here. Um, so I can come here up to this tweet page, and I can write something. And I can say, whoa, this looks super cool. Uh, and then I can comment that. When I do so, uh, I essentially take my um, Ethereum wallet and I sign the message, which proves that I was the one uh, making this annotation. This web annotation is then wrapped into a verifiable credential, which is what contains the signature and allows for anyone to verify it. So at this point, my comment has been published. Uh, and if I go back, I can see it here. Uh, now I can go again and I can do another one. If we come into another browser and we open the, the exact same page, so this exact same tweet, just reloading so everyone sees that this is fresh. Uh, we can open the annotation here, the, the extension, I mean. And both of them are here, which is super cool. OK, so how does this work? Uh, the web extension allows for, the, um, for an easy user interaction. Then we have a publishing service, uh, which broadcasts and caches annotations. And then we use a subgraph from the graph um, for easy data access and integration between IPFS and Ethereum. So someone submits an annotation, the publisher takes it, stores it on, stores it on IPFS, uh, then when a batch is full, makes an Ethereum transaction, and then the graph captures that Ethereum transaction data and sends it either back to the publisher or directly back to the extension. So back to some questions now. Um, why do we need a publishing service? It is very important uh, for the system to keep track of the canonical order of all public annotations. It's the only way to make sure that none of them disappear and like, are censored. So we store annotation logs on Ethereum. However, doing one transaction, one transaction per annotation would be extremely expensive. Just imagine having to pay for every, every single uh, tweet or comment that you make. So we came up with this optimization. It's a publishing service that can aggregate transactions um, and allows just one transaction to record, to record any number of annotations. It could be one, it could be 10,000. It really just depends on how long you want to wait for the transaction to be processed. Um, this service is not a single point of failure because anyone can run their own. They just need to take this, the, the server code and run their own. So what's next? Well, the first thing naturally is to deploy to mainnet uh, and then implement native interactions with IPFS and Ethereum. So that no one can, so so that anyone who wants to be totally decentralized can be totally decentralized. Um, then we could work on creating a network of publishers, so having several entities running their own publishing services, um, and those entities could then figure out incentive mechanisms um, to support the infrastructure and transaction costs. We can just imagine that with uh, Ethereum too, this would be insanely cheaper. Uh, 
Um, that's all we have for you. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the demo and check out the GitHub repos, install the extension, play around with it, and let us know what you think. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pan. Uh, over to the judges. Um, this was very cool. Um, it looks like a great project. Is the intention that this would always be public annotations, or did you also think about private or, for example, like team annotations for web pages? Um, so we didn't really think about it. I'm guessing for private annotations, you'd have somehow to uh, encrypt the content and share some key for other people to be able to see it. Um, yeah, I think it can be done. We just don't have it right as like an answer to you right now on how we could do that. Um, but we we did we did yeah yeah. So that's that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, it made, makes sense to start with public comments for sure. Uh, we did implement, uh, or actually, like we, we have a design. I, I'm not sure the code is there. A mechanism for whitelisting, so that you are only exposed to the ones that you want, because uh, that's a way to prevent uh, spam. Because if, if this becomes super cheap and everyone's going to use it, and then you just become uh, spammed by by everyone, which is not desirable, obviously. That's cool. Uh, that's super awesome. Uh, did you guys? I was wondering if you guys thought about how to. Uh, make the solution work even if the url to which you're attaching content to changes over time like how would you canonicalize that um yeah yeah that's a, that's a yeah that's a very good question so right now um we built this one for twitter because we wanted to get something done fast and twitter is just the most popular thing so the way we are identifying, um, like the way we figure out how to show the comments based on the tweet is based on the username and the tweet ID. Um, so if the tweet's URL changed tomorrow, as long as we had some clue to who the user is and what the tweet ID is, we could still do it. Um, but then you can think of other things. Maybe what we could do would be take the date of the tweet, take like the content of the tweet itself, hash all of that, that becomes the ID that we use to point to the thing, right? Um, yeah, then just becomes like, how do you, how, how do you, um, how do you fingerprint that content? Because it would also be pretty cool to be able to show it on the Twitter feed, right? Which is not right now, because on the Twitter feed, it's always the same URL, but you have tons of tweets. Uh, so we cannot simply just grab the idea of each one of them. Um, but yeah, we, we thought about all of that, just super complex stuff to, to get done very fast. Pretty cool. I'm also thinking about deleted tweets, right? Which is also a problem. So you ideally, like you would you could leverage IPFS and take a, a screenshot of the tweet and publish it to IPFS. And then yes. when you visit the profile of that particular user, you could like display a badge if you've detected deleted tweets or something like that yeah. and like recover those from IPFS along with a comment thread. Uh, if that yeah. happens to anyone, right? Yeah. Uh, you could also think about a decentralized internet archive to use this type of stuff. Uh, and you can also include the tweet inside of the web extension. I think part of the web extension spec is that you can actually include the original content. Um, so we could also do that. And it will, do, it will all be encapsulated in the same standardized data format, which is awesome because then uh, other applications that implement the spec, uh, it will just work with everyone, right? Yeah, this is super cool. And as a follow-up to that, I saw you also build a subgraph. Like, are there any sort of applications that you imagine being built on top of the network or any sort of integrations with like other sort of similar tangential products? Um, yes, so um, the good thing about this is that it's super agnostic. Uh, it works on Twitter today, but with minimal modifications can work on any website for any content that you want. Um, so we could very easily change it to work on something else. It's just really a matter of like we discussed first, how do, ident how do we identify content? how from that content you decide what to show. Um, so yeah, and about uh, thinking about more services, you can actually think about the publishing network, which is this set of uh, parties that take your annotations and actually issue them to IPFS uh, and Ethereum. You can think of a lot of business models to support that. Um, you can think donation-based models for things that are like really important that the community cares about. You can also think of a model where you pay a subscription and then you are allowed to do X comments per month or per year. Um, so yeah, tons of interesting stuff that we can do around this. Awesome. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, we're, we're out of time for this one. So we're going to move on to the next, but awesome presentation. Thanks so much for being part of Hackafast.
Um, so the next project is, is uh, our, our last one for today. Um, this project is uh, IPFS recovery. Uh, and I understand that I'm gonna play your video as before, and, and then we'll move into Q&A. So just let me get that set up. This video is our submission for HackFS 2020, IPFS recovery. Coming into this hackathon, I had some experience working with Erasure codes in the context of distributed systems. And I thought this was a very natural solution for IPFS, which faces some problems that we'll see shortly. Some of these problems are data corruption, which can be caused by things like coffee pouring on your laptop or a lightning storm taking out the power grid of an entire city, which can cause losses in potentially vital information. Another problem is node churn, which is when nodes just drop off for whatever reason. For example, their power could drop off or the person just closed their IPFS client. Permanent availability of content is not guaranteed in the face of censorship. This is a pivotal problem that IPFS purports to solve and has been doing so for the last few years. Attackers can go to any extent to try to get content off the network and it is our prerogative to ensure that data persists at all costs. Finally, availability of resources is hindered by transient connectivity. When a node is downloading information from another, it could fail to download the information properly due to a faulty internet connection. The solution to these problems is erasure coding. Erasure coding is a method of data protection in which data is broken into fragments, expanded and encoded with redundant data pieces and stored across a set of different locations or storage media. What this actually means is data that is erasure coded becomes a sort of hydra where if you chop off some of the heads, they can be regenerated and it's impossible to get rid of it unless you destroy most or all of the data chunks. It's actually worth consuming some extra storage to obtain this better data resiliency and even routing performance, as perhaps redundant chunks could be a fewer hops away than data chunks. What we actually built is an abstract erasure coding module that operates over IPLD Merkle DAG. There is an elegant integration with GoIPFS along with CLI utilities that you'll see shortly in our demo. How this works is that the root node of a content DAG is passed into the encode function which operates on the entire DAG according to the instructions specified by the erasure coding scheme that implements our module. We created two set schemes. One is the industry standard read Solomon code, which is used by a lot of big companies such as Facebook and Amazon to protect their data centers. We also implemented a novel alpha entanglement code, which features a simple self-healing parity lattice. This is bleeding edge erasure code technology, which is being actively investigated by distributed systems researchers, notably for Ethereum Swarm. We also wrote some test plans using test ground for simulating network interactions and seeing how network holds up. So now we're gonna see the CLI client in action. First, the client is initialized and a folder filled with files is uploaded onto the network. Then the folder is encoded. Following this, the refs are displayed so we can see what the contents of the folder are and randomly selected blocks of data are deleted. And finally, we can see that the recover function still works. So why does IPFS need recovery? Well, data distribution in the limitless manner that is in the core of IPFS requires strong data integrity. We wanna ensure content persists on the network at all costs. And further, recovery is a long requested feature for IPFS on various layers. There's an open issue from 2016 on GitHub that proposes read Solomon erasure coding. There are currently no existing solutions, especially ones that natively work with the IPLD Merkle DAG, which is why we thought it would be awesome to integrate something directly with the core. Finally, it's a modular interface for any pluggable erasure scheme. So in the future, if there is something much better than anything that we have ever seen before, we could just plug that right into our module. We have quite a few plans for the future. Namely, we want to upgrade to the more complex alpha entanglement parity lattice. This will allow us to create self-healing networks, which can tol tolerate a lot of faults. And further, we want to take this down to the DHT overlay network level so that we can actually have low level routing performance increase as well as resilience. We want to create some specs for formalization through active discussions with the community. We also want to create JavaScript, Go, and other language implementations in the future. Finally, we want to battle test the network empowered by erasure coding resilience. This is the awesome team that brought you this hack. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll pass to the judges. Uh, I think you're hitting the nail on the head with this with this idea. Um, 
as you duly noted in the presentation, it has been a long, long standing request and uh, definitely it can be applied at many layers. And the fact that you picked the IPLD layer uh, makes it almost like generalizable to everything to everything else, which is really, really awesome because like you, you pick kind of like that the foundation of the way that data is encoded um, across the stack. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, I really like the fact that you use test ground, uh, spoke very near and dear to me, <laughs> very, uh, is, um, yeah, pretty, pretty cool to, uh, to see that, to see that in action. I was wondering, uh, a couple of things. Uh, can you tell us more about the team, uh, that built this? How did you get the idea? Are you like, what are your future plans? Are you planning to contribute this to IBFS or spin it off into a, a like a business or something else uh, or, or um, a long standing project or, or, or something else. And, and yeah, how was your experience with test ground? <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll answer the first couple of questions. Uh, so I have been working with Erasure codes for like about a year ish uh, for a company I started uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it does erasure coding. It, it, I work with someone else who was like a patented erasure code. So i learned a lot about the field and, I learned about some stuff that's happening in this space, the Ethereum ecosystem and so on. In fact, I was in touch with some of the researchers who developed uh, alpha entanglements uh, and they gave me a lot of resources on how to implement this and stuff. So I thought, you know, this would just be great. I ended up meeting Klieb and Sarah uh, during the hackathon and both of them are ex extremely uh, well experienced Go, Go coders. So uh, yeah, that was, that was really great. Uh, as for the future, yes, I do think uh, we want to add this into the IPFS project. As, as I mentioned, we want to discuss with you guys, see what you guys want. Uh, because I'm sure you guys have some ideas on how you want this implemented. So, you know, we can collaborate and figure out how to move forward. And uh, if the others have anything to add to that. Um, I'm suggesting you to look at source code, uh, how it's implemented, like how we did actual, how we put it into the IPLD layer, because uh, in, in the first version, even zero version, because I know that there is a like incoming version of Go IPLD Prime, and uh, we haven't had enough time to dive deeper in that, uh, but we uh, have actually working um, like recovery for like current IPFS. Uh, also, like um, I think you haven't seen anything for it in the demo because like it was blurred. Uh, but uh, we, I can do a live demo if you're interested, or you can try it yourself uh, on our GitHub. There is an explanation on step by step how you can try it out. We have a forked version of IPFS with the new CLI that integrates this. Also, there is a description how it's all integrated. So if you're interested, just go ahead and look at this. Uh, Josh, do we do we have time for a quick demo? Do other other judges have more questions? Um, uh, I mean, this is the last team, so I, I think there's not a big deal if we go a bit over time, as long as the, the judges have a moment for it. Uh, certainly no objection from me. Let's go for it. Yeah, demo would be great. Okay, let's start. Let me share my screen. This one. So... Can you see here uh, my terminal? Let's start from the scratch. I'll remove IPFS, then I'll do IPFS uh, init, uh, empty one. Uh, then what I'll do is IPFS add. Um, I'll do this, uh, there is a, like a directory that has a uh, like bunch of different photos. Uh, you'll see them next. Uh, also I'll use a CD version one. So like uh, nothing sp special here, just uh, like uh, like logos uh, filtered in by the by the like protocol apps, Ethereum Foundation consensus, like all this stuff. Uh, this is not important. Um, then what we can do is IPFS and uh, recovery encode. I'll use the suggestion, so we can see that hashes here match. Uh, recovering code, what this does. Then it uh, produce a hash of the encoded version for this hash. Um, also, I think uh, we should add, uh, like it's quite easy to add a new option for uh, IPFS that will just do the same thing as a chunker. 
where you can specify the algorithm and maybe some um, like there is a recoverability uh, optional uh, that can like I'll discover it later if you're interested. So we have uh, this uh, encoded, uh, encoded hash, IPF. Uh, then what we do is uh, IPFS refs on that hash, also recursive. Uh, this way we can see um, all the blocks. Um, this, um, this root um, CID is pointing to, like whole deck. Uh, then what I'll do is to, uh, I'll just um, remove, um, bunch of them randomly, it doesn't matter, uh, through block rem, just any of them, example, this one, and maybe this one, or this one. So th those are deleted. Then IPFS, um, uh, then what we can do is actually use uh, like plain IPFS get, to uh, retrieve this this hash, send it onto key, and uh, we will still be able to get it, uh, as well as uh, on the other side, like meaning on the um, on the network that can uh, uh, that that is connected to our node, and uh, it sees that we serve this uh, this hash. So um, let me first. Um, but that doesn't matter. Okay, uh, if as get, so I'll do this offline to for you to see that uh, you won't fetch it somewhere else. And uh, as you can, uh, as you've seen, the like this is um, plain IPFS without any data. Um, so we see those error message. Those are like not important. This is just a small hack and uh, implementation. But actually, uh, we were able to get those. Uh, get the content, even remove those um, those blocks. So like they, they were not existing. And, like um, I, I'm not sure if it's enough proof, proof for you that it works as it works. But yeah, yes, no, it I, <laughs> yeah, I totally trust. I totally trust that it works. I was interested in in seeing it in action. This is pretty cool. I can see that you know the size of the recovered blob is obviously you know a few magnitudes lot larger than you know the original the original directory. Mm. Yeah was packed which makes yeah. a lot of sense uh it would be pretty cool to see this integrated with uh with bit swap and potentially graph sync going forward i think there's a lot of stuff that we can do at the graph sync level to be able to convey metadata about you know the erasure the erasure coding policy that has been attached to a particular you know blob um or a particular ipld node there's a lot of stuff that we can do there i think you've built some like pretty interesting plumbing for this that then needs to be like percolated uh, and such that we can um, represent, you know, the erasure coding policy at different layers so that when you go out and fetch a particular blob, a particular, you know, IPLD node that of which several leaves have, you know, disappeared from the network, you will like backtrack and realize that you can actually recover those leaves uh, using the data that you already have. So like, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty awesome. I'm, I'm, this definitely got my juices flowing. Pretty cool. Uh, like uh, I want to say that uh, this is implemented on a dark service layer, meaning that uh, it actually works on top of BitSwap. So like BitSwap doesn't know about all the magic happening here, and uh, um, nice. like we have a there is one issue uh, before making it fully working uh, on the network, uh, like where you can do one multiple nodes on the network, one uh, node adds the file, delete some blocks and other node just tries to get it. It actually can get uh, get the blocks, uh, get get the file, the content, but it, it should wait for uh, like till the uh, node understand that it can find uh, those blocks on um, DHT. So exactly. uh, there's, we need to add just kind of like, there is an issue on a GitHub like with several solutions for that, but that, um, uh, so we, um, the, from the user standpoint, we it's hard to understand um, where to, where's the moment where we should recover the blocks because um, the dark service waits for blocks and it can wait like till the context is canceled or, or other stuff. Yeah. And if we just do recovery by default, it will recover uh, once we get uh, enough uh, amount of files. 
where it can uh, like just start a timer, wait for some time, like start a timer where uh, it understands that we have enough blocks to, rec uh, to yeah. recover missing one, then like wait for some time out and uh, I think we do the actual recovery. Yeah, we could totally share some ideas in, in an offline discussion. One potential way is to, like I'm thinking about if recovery, re running the recovery function on the partial set of blobs that you've already retrieved is not too costly. You could run this yeah. on a, you know, on a, on, on a loop essentially, or for every block that you receive, or maybe with some debouncing there to make sure that you're not running it too yeah. frequently. Debouncing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I like right, I'll have to jump in there because I'm going to steal these judges away for a bit. Um, thank you, IPFS Recovery. Uh, thank you to all the teams who presented today. Uh, it is so exciting to see what got built uh, over these several weeks of, of seeing you all work so hard um, from a distance in the Slack channel, but it's amazing to see the final product. Um, so thank you again. I uh, hope you can uh, tune in for some other judging sessions um, and we'll see you at the closing ceremonies. Uh, which will be next Tuesday. Um, judges, if you can stick around, I'll send you another call link. Um, we'll do a quick debrief and then we'll be done. Okay, thanks everybody.